Hello and welcome to this second worked example of mesh analysis in electronic circuits. Again, if you haven't watched our previous video, or better yet, the first introduction video, the introduction to mesh analysis, it's really important that you watch those videos first. If you're watching on YouTube, they'll be linked in the description, but we're going to jump straight in with this example, so it's, it's best to watch those first before this one. But here we have a slightly more complicated circuit than our previous examples. And what you can see hopefully is that we have three circuit pins in this particular circuit. We have three uh, mesh currents and we've called these I1, I2 and I3. And what we're going to do is follow exactly the same principles that we discussed in our introduction video. We're going to use exactly the same methods and we're going to get three equations now, three uh, equations that form our system of equations. And these are going to look something like this. Um, we have 10, looking at our first pane here, we have 10 volts. And that's equal to I1 flowing through these two components that are in that pane, uh, the 100 ohms and the 56 ohms. We're subtracting from that this uh, anti-clockwise element that enters into our pane uh, minus uh, 56 times I2 flowing through that 56 resistor there and we also have our minus 100 I3 because we have I3 flowing in a, a relatively anti-clockwise direction through this 100 ohm resistor um, in that first pane there. Again, if this doesn't make too much sense, it's worth watching our introductory video where we talk about this in a bit more detail and how to set these equations up. And hopefully you can look through these yourself, um, but these second and third equations are set up in a very similar way. Um, let's simplify these a little bit because there's some additions here where we've added together different resistors. Um, we can simplify those uh, to look something like this, which is a little bit tidier. Um, a few points to, to, just to consider when we construct these equations here. If a loop or pane doesn't contain a voltage source, then it's equal to zero, like this third equation here. We've said this in our previous examples, it's important to keep the terms in order, I1, I2 and I3. Uh, and you can see here, we've been consistent with that I1, I2 and I3 are always in that order. And this is going to be particularly useful if we use matrices to solve this system of equations. The last point that I want to make very quickly is quite a useful one, especially if you've ordered your terms like this in I, in I1, I2, I3 order. What you'll notice is that all of the terms are negative except for the currents that are native to the loop in question. So what I mean by that, let's take this second loop um, for example here and the second loop I2 is native to that to that particular loop, that pane. Um, I2 belongs in there as it were and what we see here is that all of the other currents are negative but the I2 is positive. So here we have minus 56I1 plus 176I2 minus 120I3. These other, um, these other currents, I1 and I3, that don't belong in that second pane are going to be negative. But the current that lives in that pane, as it were, is positive. And so what you'll see if you've set up your equations in order, I1, I2, I3, you'll kind of get a diagonal... Um, series of positive numbers. You'll have this first term being positive in the first equation, uh, 156I1. You'll have this um, second term in the second equation being positive, and you'll have this third term in the third equation being positive. So these, so this sort of diagonal is positive, and all the other terms you'll notice are negative. So it's a good little visual check that you've set up your equations correctly. Anyway, We've set up our system of equations here, and all that remains is to solve them. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at two different ways that we can solve these equations. We're going to look at Kramer's rule and we're going to look at an inverse matrix approach. So let's start with the first method, Kramer's rule. And we mentioned the second method was the inverse matrix approach, obviously involving matrices. But our first method, Kramer's rule, involves matrices as well. We're going to start by presenting our system of equations that we saw before. We're going to present that in matrix form, and it's going to look something like this. Kramer's rule tells us to do a few things. Uh, first of all, to find the determinant of the square matrix. You'll see here that we've got a square matrix formed of these coefficients. Um, notice again that diagonal um, series of positive numbers going from top left to bottom right and all the other terms being negative that we mentioned before. It's a little bit more obvious there. Uh, we're going to find the determinant of this square matrix. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to substitute this column here, this voltage column, um, on the other side of the equals, on the right-hand side. We're going to substitute this column into each of the rows in our square matrix here. And so because we've got a three by three matrix here, we've got three rows, we're going to end up with three new matrices. We're going to end up with um, the first row being replaced with this column here. We're going to end up with a matrix where the second row has been replaced with this column. And we're going to end up with a matrix where the third row has been replaced by this column. And we're going to find the determinant of each of these new matrices as well. And then finally, step four, we're going to divide each of these new determinants by the original determinant um, that we found in step one. And this will give us our current values. Okay, so let's put this into practice. But for the sake of keeping this video as short as possible, we won't uh, be covering how to calculate the determinant of a matrix in this video. We have a separate video where we look at that. And again, if you're watching on YouTube, I'll put a link for that. In our case, though, for this original matrix here, uh, we're going to call the determinant of this matrix, we're going to call it D. And D turns out to be this, uh, 165376 or 1,653,760. Now, this seems like a big number. Don't worry, uh, this is quite normal and our later steps actually will, will rectify this. We'll get some reasonable values for currents that we're looking to find. So, thinking back to step two, step two asked us to substitute the answer column or the voltage column into each column of our square matrix. And since our square matrix has three columns, we're gonna do this three times. And we'll see something that looks like this. So we've replaced the first column here, we've replaced the second column here, and we've replaced the third column here. And so we have these three new matrices. And again, we're gonna skip the working, but if we find the determinants of each of these, this is step three now to find the determinant of these new matrices, we're going to call these D1, D2, and D3. And we find we get these values here. We have D1 is 222,240. We have D2 is 106,640. And we have D3 is 121,600. Again, if you don't know where these numbers have come from, it's worth looking at our video where we talk about calculating the determinant of a three by three matrix. I didn't want this video to, to last too long, so we, we've skipped the working here. Um, step four, which we mentioned right back at the start, was to divide each of these new determinants by the original determinant to find current values. So what do we mean by that? Well, we have these three new determinants here, D1, D2, and D3. All we're going to do is divide each of these by our original determinant, which we just call D. And so what we can say is this. We can say I1, our first current here, is equal to D1 over D. I2 is equal to D2 over D. And I3 is equal to D3 over D. And so when we set those up, uh, we'll see something like this. And we get these three currents here. We have I1 
is equal to 0.13438 amps or 134 milliamps. Uh, I2 is equal to 0.06443 amps and I3 is equal to 0.073529 amps. So as was the case in our previous example, we've now worked out these three mesh currents, I1, I2 and I3. But on their own, these mesh currents don't really tell us much. And what we might be asked to do is to work out the current that flows through each of the components in our circuit. So let's take this 100 ohm resistor as an example. If we look back at our diagram here, hopefully you can see that current I1 is going to flow through this resistor. And it's going to flow through that resistor from left to right, as we've set up our diagram here, with I1 being clockwise in this pane. Hopefully you can see that I2 won't flow through this 100 ohm resistor. This 100 ohms has nothing to do with I2 as it's drawn there. I3 will flow through that resistor, but it will flow through from right to left. And so we have two currents flowing through this 100 ohm resistor. We've got I1 flowing from left to right. We've got I3 flowing from right to left. And so the total current flowing through that 100 ohm resistor is going to be the difference between these two currents, I1 and I3. And similarly, we can say that this 56 ohm resistor, we'll have I1 flowing down and we'll have I2 flowing up. And 120 ohms here, we have I2 flowing to the left, we have I3 flowing to the right. So again, we're working on differences in currents for each of these. The only exception in this circuit is 68 ohms up the top, because the only current that's going to flow through that is I3. And so we already know the current flowing through that resistor there. It's just going to be equal to I3. So we can write these out in full. We can say that our resistor currents are going to be represented something like this. And so we have um, some magnitudes of the currents that flow in each of these components there. Finally, for this video, we also said that we'd look at a different method using the inverse matrix approach. And again, just for the sake of time, we're not going to look at how we can calculate the inverse matrix in this video. We have a separate video for that, which will be linked as well. Um, but we'll show how we can use this method at least to find the same results or hopefully find the same results as we did using Kramer's rule. Uh, again, we start by setting up our system of equations in matrix form. And so we have something like this that we saw before. And let's sort of suppose that we can write this equation um, in the form AX equals Y. And that's, that's meant to be equivalent to what we've got here. So A is representing this 3 by 3 matrix. And X is representing this, this column of unknown currents here. And then A, um, sorry, Y is representing these... Um, voltages here. So AX, AX equals Y is our kind of equivalent there. And again, we're not going to prolong this section by repeating the method for finding the inverse of a matrix. Um, it was quite a long video as it was, and we have that linked if you're not sure where this is coming from. But in this case, if we find the inverse matrix, we'll end up with something that looks like this. Um, in fractional form as, as rational numbers, or we can put those as decimals, it would look something like this. Now, we mentioned this formulation before, AX equals Y, a kind of simplified version of our system of equations there. And what we can say is, therefore, X equals A to the minus 1, or in other words, the inverse of A, um, multiplied by y, or the dot product with y. So what we have here is um, written out in full. We have our matrix inverted, our inverse matrix here, which is a to the minus 1. Um, and that's uh, made as a dot product with 
our column Y, which was, if you remember, our uh, column of voltages. And when we carry out that dot product, we find that we get these results here, 0 0.13438, 0 0.064483, and 0 0.073529. And hopefully you'll spot that those match the current I1, I2, and I3 that we got using the previous method of Kramer's rule. So again, we haven't really discussed the dot product here. We haven't really discussed how to find the inverse matrix here. We have those in separate videos, but just for the sake of time, I just thought I'd illustrate how we can use that approach to get the same results as well. Remember too, that simply finding I1, I2, and I3 uh, might not be sufficient, but we can do the same thing as we did before, working out the differences of these currents to find the current that actually flows in each component. That bit doesn't change from our previous section. So I hope you found this video useful. Uh, first of all, to explore a slightly more complicated example of mesh analysis, but then to look at two different methods of how we can solve um, that system of equations to find those three mesh currents. Firstly, using Kramer's rule, and secondly, the inverse matrix. 